Are you ready for the word today? Let's talk about it. We've been in this great series, Three Things That Last Forever. We've been focusing on faith. Today, we're going to make a little turn, and uh, uh, we're going to talk about this whole thing uh, about hope. And uh, how many of you understand this when it comes to faith, that we barely have scratched the surface? There are so much more than we can talk about faith. And uh, However, Paul uh, gave us two crucial more things that he says will last forever. And I don't know about you. I want to focus on the things that will last forever, not on the things that are temporary. And watch our key verse. Let's look at our key verse. Can we put our key verse up on the screen? Let's put it up there. Let's read it together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Three things will last forever. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. How many of you know, if you don't know that verse by now, uh, it's a problem? So uh, we, we ought to know that verse by now. So if I ask you, what three things will last forever, your answer would be what? Mm, and one of those three, oh, you smart people, you, that is wonderful. Now, I believe that hope is one of the most misunderstood words in our vernacular. And uh, there are two kinds of hope. There is biblical hope, and then there's worldly hope, natural hope. And whenever we talk about hope, it is seemingly always used in a sort of a last-ditch effort. You know, I really wanted things to change, but now I'm just hoping they will change. Or, you know, so, or we get to a place, oh, I, I, you know, now the only thing we can do is what? Hope. And it seems that we understand hope as this, as this thing that we use whenever, when we seem that we use hope in a more hopeless situation than a hopeful situation. And that's absolutely contrary to biblical hope. How many of you know that's not what biblical hope is about? As a matter of fact, our love and our faith is being fueled by our hope. If we don't have hope, we cannot have love. If we don't have hope, we cannot have faith. Hope is actually the foundation of our faith, and it's also the foundation of our love. Why? Because hope deals with our future, and you've got to get this. I want you to turn with me to the uh, uh, book of Colossians, Colossians 1, and look at these couple of verses because it's going to show this as we dig the foundation of hope, and then we're going to talk about why uh, things that cause us to lose our hope today. But yes, you, you, you understand. Look at Colossians 1, verse 4 and 5. Are you out there with me today? Check this out. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. So there he mentions two things. What does he mention? Faith and love. Watch this. Which come from your what? Oh, man, that's interesting. Of what God has reserved for you in heaven. Talk about future. You have had this what? expectations ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Now, if you're struggling to follow, we do have notes. And uh, if you have our app, you can just look on uh, the app. We have the notes there as well, and it'll be on the overhead. That way, there's no tricking around here, all right? So just so that you know. So look at this verse again. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Did you notice that Paul called this hope a confident hope? Somebody say a confident hope. So it's got nothing to do with, oh, I just hope things will turn out. Oh, you know, maybe. That's, it's not, that's not what hope is. Uh, he says that we've had, he had this, and he says we've had this expectation. Somebody say expectation. Now, that doesn't sound like barely holding on, does it? I mean, he calls it confident. He calls it an expectation. So I put my definition of hope. My, my definition of biblical hope is as follows, and it's derived from this verse. Are you ready to write it in? Here it is. Hope is the confident expectation of the future God promised that fuels my faith in Christ and my love for others. Hope is the confident expectation of the future God promised that fuels my faith in Christ and my love for others. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a good definition. Hope helps me cope when my mind feels like uh, I'm a rope dope You know what I mean? You see, hope, what, what does hope do? Hope feeds my faith and love because hope deals with my mind in the same way as faith and love covers my heart. I want you to check out this other verse in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8 because it's going to show us this. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of what? Faith and love. Now, let me just stop there for a moment. Where, do you, where does a breastplate go? Over your heart, right? So we know that it has, to, it has to do with, so we love from the heart. We have faith from the heart. But I want you to notice when it talks about hope. Watch this. And for a helmet, the what? Hope of what? Salvation. 
So when, when Paul refers to this, this understanding of this confident hope, this understanding of this expectation, this understanding of what this hope is all about, he's making sure that you and I recognize that, first of all, that, that hope feeds the fact that we are able to be in that place where we can have faith in Christ Jesus. Hope also enables me to love other people. That's what hope does. So hope gives me the feel, the feel to have faith, the feel, uh, uh, the feel to have love. And then he talks about this in, in, in this great verse in Thessalonians 5, verse 8. And he says, you've got to have an understanding that faith is like a breastplate. It covers your heart. And uh, hope, is like, uh, uh, hope is something else. And love is like that breastplate. So faith and love is like that breastplate. It's in your heart. But here's what hope is. Hope is for your mind. Because your mind affects the way that you believe. When, when we feel like we are just going through the motion of life, it has a way of kind of eroding our hope. Understand this today, that you can live 40 days without food, three days without water, but you cannot live a moment without hope. You need hope to cope. You've heard me say this many times. I always encourage our leaders. We are not dope dealers. We are hope dealers. At The Rock, that's, that's what we deal with. We ain't dealing with dope. We deal with what? Hope, because you need hope to what? Cope. And the challenge for us is to have the ability and discernment between what is true hope and what is false hope. And the reason we do certain things and pursue certain things with our lives is because we believe it's going to bring a, a sense of peace, joy, and satisfaction. But no matter how hard we, we acquire, no matter how much we acquire, no matter how many Amazon Prime Day deals we hit, in the end, it leads to a place called what? Disappointment. There is a natural hope, and we all have natural hopes. Everybody in this room, everybody watching online, whether you are a, whether you are a Christ follower or not a Christ follower, you can be a, a blatant atheist today. You, you're not even liking anything that I'm saying. Every single one of us have hope. We all have natural hope. Now, the hope that I'm going to talk to you today, you cannot get from a natural place. You can only get it from a supernatural place. The hope that I'm going to talk to you today is not, if, you, if you're not a Christ follower, you cannot have this hope. If you don't believe in God, you cannot have. This is not a hope that you can hold on to. Now, you can have a natural hope, and we all have natural hopes. And, you know, some of you, uh, you know, uh, hope that the Los Angeles Raiders, sorry, I mean the, uh, the Oakland Raiders. Sorry, I mean the Las Vegas Raiders. <laughs> will one day win the Super Bowl. Now, that is a natural hope. And up to this point, it has led to continual disappointment. But there's a hope that leads not to disappointment. How many of you know there are natural hopes that you and I have that lead in disappointment and leads to disappointment? But there is a supernatural hope that Paul refers to that will never disappoint. And we've got to get this. Watch this. Look with me in Romans 5, 3 to 5. I'm just building this, okay? I haven't preached yet. Watch this. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says this. We can rejoice too when we run into what? Problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop what? endurance and endurance develops strength of what character now watch and character strengthens our what confident hope of salvation and this what hope will not lead to what disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love oh what a loaded verse what a verse we can rejoice when we go into problems and trials. We can rejoice when we go, why? Because it develops endurance. That means it helps us to, to finish. It helps us. How, how many of you know that problems develop you? It develops your faith muscle. It develops your hope muscle. It, when you get trials, when you feel piled on, and you feel it's one thing after another, after another, you know, you know and, and uh, it, it happens sometimes in life. But what do we do? It gives us the endurance. And what does endurance do? People who endure are people of what? Of character. There are people who, who know they got to stick through it. People who know that this is a marathon, this, this Christ life, this, this living a life of faith. It's not a quick sprint to the end. It's not a quick race. I'm not in it and bang, off goes the gun and bang, I'm at the finish line. No, it is, it is, it is valleys and it is hills, it is highs and it is lows, it is ups and it's down, it is good times and bad times, it is disappointing times, it is perplexing times, it is confusing times, it is hopeful times, it is hopeless times, it, it is times when I feel like I'm on the top of the mountain and, and it's times when I feel the mountain is on top of me. It's time when I feel like I'm the statue and that's great, but sometimes I'm the pigeon. And uh, uh, you know, there are all kinds of different days 
in life. And, and we have to work through this process of understanding what it is. And when you and I grasp and get a hold of what biblical hope is, it enables us. And this is what Paul is saying. He says it's that endurance, it is that character. People of character know they've been through stuff. People of character understand that life don't always turn out the way that I want it to turn out. But there is an eternal hope that I'm, that I'm hinging my wagon to. There's an eternal hope that has got nothing to do with what I get or what I don't get. It has to do with knowing who my God is and understanding where my future is. Because I have a future, I have power for today. Because I have the knowledge of where I'm going, I have power for today. Because I know who my God is, I can go through the trials. I can go through the challenges. Oh yes, I feel beaten up. Oh yes, I feel the pain in my body. Oh yes, I feel the pain and the anguish in my mind. But in the moments of despair, I know that I can put my hope in Him. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now, that's great to pump you up. The problem is Monday comes. The problem is some of you are married. And it's not a problem. It's a problem in your mind. Are you with me? The problem is some of you have to deal with difficult people. Anybody ever dealt with the difficult people? Don't raise your hand. I should ask the follow-up question. Anybody sitting next to a difficult person? <laughs> so what caused us to lose hope? Are, are you ready? Yeah. Let me, I, I'll give the point and then we'll talk about it. I'm just going to give you three and then an application. Here's the first one. When our problem seems to have no end. What causes us to lose hope when our problems seem to have no end? It is one of the things that causes us to lose hope very quickly, and that is when we are faced with a persistent, difficult situation that seems not to get better at all. We feel dumped on, we feel let down, and uh, it, it's, just, it's just like, you know, we just, it's one thing after another, after another, after another. Look, I want to use a guy that some of you may be very familiar with. It's a guy that we've used a lot, and it's a guy by the name of Job, and, uh, or Job. And uh, Job is a, is a phenomenal character in the Bible. And, and usually, you know, we think when we go through trials that we say, oh, I'm just like Job. But we can relate with Job because Job dealt with a lot. So I want to use Job here. And, and the first place I want to go to is Job chapter 6. And I want you to listen to what Job is saying. He's talking about this whole, this unrelenting problems in his life, this problems that seem to have no end. And uh, I'm going to use the message Bible a lot today because it brings out the nuances of, of the communication that Job has. Watch this. Uh, he says this in Job 6. If my misery could be weighed, if you could pile the whole bitter load on the scales, it would be heavier than all the sand of the sea. How many of you know he's got some real problems? Watch this. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder that I'm screaming like a caged cat? The arrows of God Almighty are in me, poison arrows, and I'm poisoned all through. God has dumped the whole works on me. Donkeys bray and cows moo when they run out of pasture. So don't expect me to keep quiet in this. Do you see what God has dished out for me? It's enough to turn anyone's stomach. Everything in me is repulsed by it. It makes me sick. How many of you know he's not a having, oh, happy day? <laughs> you know, he's not singing that old, old gospel song, something good is going to happen to you today. He's not singing that. The problem at this point is that Job is lacking what we all lack when we are faced with a painful and difficult situation, and that is we lack perspective. When you are in a storm and the wind is howling and the things are flying around you and the rain is pelting down on you and the night is pitch black, you lack one thing because you can't see. You lack the ability to see. He lacks perspective because you can see from these verses that Job is literally saying, he's saying that God is my problem. He says, God is the one that did this to me. God is the one that dumped this on me. How can, you know, how can God do this to me? You know, this thing day after day after day. I want you to fill out this phrase. Your perspective about your problems will determine the level of your hope. Your perspective about your problems will determine the level of your hope. I, I need you to understand this, and you need to understand this very, very clearly. Everybody has some level of problems. I should have had a better amen than that. I have problems. You have problems. All God's people have problems. As a matter of fact, let's take it out of the church. Everybody has got some kind of problem. And we always think, or let me use me, I always think my problems are worse than anybody else's. 
That's the, that's the way we are. We, well, you know, nobody goes through what I'm going through. Nobody's dealing with what I'm dealing with. And that's, that's, that's a perspective problem. And you see, depend, depending on how you see and how you look at your problem, is going to determine whether you're going to be hopeful or hopeless. Now, there's a right perspective and there's a wrong perspective when it comes to problems. Uh, when you have the wrong perspective about your problem, you always think, you know, my problems are unsolvable. Let me say this to you very clearly. If your problem is unsolvable, it's not a problem, it's a fact of life. If you can't solve it, if there's no answer to it, then guess what? Then that's just the fact of life. You, then, then, that, then you've got to get to a place of acceptance. It's a fact of life. But problems, as far as we know problems, they are solvable. That's the right perspective. So when you run into a problem, your first thing should not be, oh, man, you know, I'm always going to be, this is unsolvable. Your first thing is, well, you know what? Yes, this is a problem. Yes, this is a challenge. But it is solvable. I can solve it. Another one, uh, another attitude that we have that's a wrong attitude about problems, the wrong perspective, is that problems are permanent. This is just a permanent situation. But how many of you know problems are temporary? You solve one, and here's the thing, here's the good news. When you solve one problem, another one will make his way to you. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever realized that? You don't, so you're not going to solve a problem and say, Woo, shundala, this is awesome. Now I've got no more problems. The only way you can have no more problems is to die. That's the only way. The only people that have no problems are the people in the grave. That, that's the only people with no problems. So, so, so you've got to understand problems are, are, are permanent. That's a wrong perspective. What you look at, you say problems are temporary. Here's another wrong perspective, and that is that problems are not a part of life. How many of you can laugh at that? You know, we know that problems are a part of life. And, and don't let somebody tell you, well, if you have problems, you know, you're out of the will of God. If somebody tells you problems, you're out of the will of God. Now, let, let, me, let, me, let me put a little caveat in there. There are some problems in your life that 80% of your problems you caused. Hello? And there are some problems in your life because you refuse to obey God. That, that, that's absolutely true. But not all problems are there because you obeyed God. Sometimes you have a problem because you did obey God. Sometimes you're in the worst storm of your life because you did do what God told you to do. So we've got to get this. Problems are a part of life. Another wrong perspective is problems make us bitter. We become angry just like, just like Job is saying. He says, I'm like a caged cat. Have you ever heard a caged cat? I mean, that's what he's saying. That's what I'm doing. I'm like a caged cat. He's bitter. But problems ought to make us better because we just heard what Paul says about them is that they are supposed to build what in us? Character. They're supposed to build endurance in us. Another wrong perspective is that problems control us. I, I, I tell you what, this is one of the things I wish I had more time to delve into this. Because a lot of people are controlled by their problems. A lot of people allow their problems to determine how they're going to respond. And also determine what kind of attitude and what kind of approach they're going to have. But you, you, you cannot be problem focused. You have to be solution focused. You, you've got to understand this. It cannot control me. So what do I do with a problem? You've got to allow a problem to challenge you. Not control you, but challenge you. Challenge you to find the answer. Challenge you. Listen, there is no problem that cannot be solved with sustained thinking and sustained prayer. I absolutely believe that. There is no problem that we cannot solve if we don't put great minds to it and if we don't put great hearts to it in prayer. If there's a problem and it's a problem, then guess what? It is solvable when we think about it, when we meditate on it, when we get other people's minds on it. You know, sometimes your mind might not have the answer, but somebody else's mind might have the answer. That's why we ask. So it ought to challenge us. And then uh, another wrong perspective is that problems stop us in our tracks instead of problems stretching us to where we need to go. Now, in these verses, we see that Job has the wrong perspective because he says that God is the problem. He uses an analogy of arrows, and, uh, which is related to God's judgment. And he sees himself as nothing more than a wounded animal uh, that God is shooting his poison darts at. And, and he says, I'm crying out. I'm crying out like this wounded animal in pain. I don't know if you've ever been there, but, but in your life when the pain is so bad, so deep, so real, so continuing, so unending, that you feel your strength is slowly being drained right out of you. And, and, and you get to a place where sometimes you're just emotionally numb. You are numb at any, you numb at, at, at even when I'm sharing like this, you're like, Ugh, because you can't really hear it. You are numb to any and all, including any kind of reference of God and any kind of reference of hope. Because you say, well, wait a minute, I'm, I, I've been down this freeway so many times. 
Now, now, pain, and especially emotional pain, can drain your hope quicker than a teenager your patience. And you've got to watch for that. When, when problems persist in our lives, it has the capacity to drown out God's goodness and turn up the volume of our predicament. And maybe you feel like Jer- the way that Jeremiah felt. How many of you know Jeremiah was a prophet that was known for his problems? He had one problem after another. Listen to what Jeremiah writes. I don't understand why my pain has no end. I don't understand why my injury is not cured or healed. Will you be, now he's referencing God, will you be like a brook that goes dry? Will you be like a spring that stops flowing? I don't know, maybe you've been there in your life. Maybe in that place where you say, well, wait a minute, the reason I I can't be hopeful is because I have this unending problem. It it causes us to lose hope. A second thing that causes us to lose hope, are you still with me, is when our prayers seem to go unanswered. The second thing that causes, especially as a Christ follower, when our prayers seem to go unanswered. Listen to what Job says in the same uh, chapter, verse 8. Watch. All I want is an answer to one prayer. A last request to be honored. So, so I mean, he, he's like, hey, man, I, I, I just need this one prayer. This is it. All I, all, all, all I request is to be honored. Watch this. And then listen to, me, listen to how encouraged he is. You thought he was discouraged. He, he, he compared himself to an animal in the first few verses. Now watch. He's going to the next level. Let God step on me. Squash me like a bug. Now, how many of you know that he's going deeper into depression? Because he goes from relating to himself as an animal, all right, and he relates to animals. Now he's saying, squash me like a bug. He's going from an animal to an insect. How many of you know he's in trouble, all right? And be done with me for good. At least I have the satisfaction of not having blasphemed the holy God before being passed uh, by my limits, passed past my limits. Now understand, in this situation, uh, would you agree with me that it is a good thing that God does not answer Job's prayer? How many of you would agree with me it's a good thing? Because what Job's basically saying is, kill me and get this over with. Uh, He's basically saying, God, you've been missing a lot. Now just here I am. I've got nothing left. You can't miss this time. You've hit everything else i got. Now hit me. His pain is so deep that he sees the grave as the only solution to his pain. Aren't you glad that there are some prayers that God does not answer the way you want him to answer? Now, before we get too quick to judge Job, the man lost absolutely everything. When I say everything, I'm not referring to things that he has lost. Although Job has lost his businesses, he's lost his cattle, his camels, his sheep, his goats, he's lost all of that. He lost his home, he lost his wealth. But the worst part is that Job lost that which in his mind could not be replaced. He lost his children. Now, it is one thing losing things. It is a whole other thing losing the people you love. But to make matters worse for Job is the fact, here's what made it worse for Job, is the fact that Job regularly prayed for God to cover his kids, and yet he still lost his kids. If you don't believe me, just go back reverse to Job 1 verse 5 and listen to what would happen. Watch this. After each feast, so his children would go and they party, all right? So they would have a feast. And then what Job would do, he'll call them back in and say, oh, wait a minute, I need you guys to come back, and he, you know, I want to pray over you and cover you just in case you sin. Okay, watch this. Job would send for his children and perform a ceremony as a way of asking God to forgive them for any wrongs they may have done. He would get up early the next morning and offer a sacrifice for whom? Each of them, just in case they had sinned or silently cursed God. So, so, so Job literally, after his kids would be doing all the partying, he would literally go and say, okay, all, everybody in, making sacrifices for your sin. I'm covering, uh, you know, I'm making sure you're covered. He prays over everyone, giving sacrifice for everyone. And Job must have felt, and from Scripture we know it to be true, he felt that God had led him down. Unanswered prayer or perceived unanswered prayer we feel is a direct assault on our faith and on our hope. Unanswered prayer to those who do not believe is the so-called proof of either a non-existent God for the atheist or an uncaring being for the agnostic. But for those who believe, it could actually be, hang with me now, the greatest lesson of faith. Now, I can hear you. I can feel you already. You almost think, well, wait a minute, preacher boy. How, how can I pray for something and not get it? How can that build my faith? All prayer is answered. Just not answered the way you want them to be answered. 
saying, how can I pray and believe and not get what I want? And how can that still build my faith? Hang with me, Copernicus. Listen to this. Because it teaches you one of the greatest lessons of your Christian life that you can learn about faith and trust in God. It is the lesson of who is in charge. It's what we would term the sovereignty lesson. Now, do not for one moment confuse God's sovereignty with Doris Day doctrine. Anybody remember Doris Day? The, yeah. the great uh, hymn she used to sing? Que sera, sera. Anybody remember that? Three of you. It's all the old people, all right? Whatever must be, must be. That's, that's not what I, when I talk about. When I talk about that, that's not what it is. It is not a fatalistic approach to life and give him a saying, well, you know, what is it to help praying anyway? It is an absolute confident trust that there are things beyond my control and there are circumstances beyond my understanding and there are situations beyond my comprehension. There's an end to my knowledge and there are limits to my wisdom and then the final realization that I am not God. You see, the question you and I have to answer before we worry about that is who are you going to bow down to in your life? Who's going to run the show? Who's going to be in charge? Listen to what Job's friend says to him in Job 22 a few chapters later. You agree, don't you, that God is in charge? He runs the universe. Just look at the stars. Yet you dare raise questions. What does God know? I don't even know. Job was pretty bold, right? What does God know? Some of us might never say that. But in the way we live, the way we respond, that's exactly what we say with our lifestyle. We show it by our actions. You will never be able to grow in your faith until you settle what I would term the lordship issue in your life. You'll never, I'm telling you right now, you go from place to place, you go from up to down, you go from this to that, one day you'll be happy, you'll be in church for two months, and then you'll be out of church for six months, and then you'll get back again, and then you'll be up, and then you'll be out. You know why? Because you are trying to run the show, you're trying to be God, and God is saying, you don't qualify to be God. Let me be God. Mm, that went down like a lead balloon. Look at Hebrews 3 verse 6, if you don't believe me. Are you, are you still there? Check this out. But Christ as the Son is in what? Charge of God's what? What is He in charge of? Part of the house? The entire house. Okay, now what? And we are... What are we? Who's in charge? Mm. Christ in charge of the entire house or just a few rooms of the house? The whole enchilada. Right? All of it. Now watch this. And we are God's house, but there's the qualifier. you got to check out the qualifier. If we what? Keep our courage and remain confident in our what? Hope in Christ. We are God's house. Notice, if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Jesus, it takes courage to believe. Listen to me. It takes courage to believe in the face of adversity. It takes courage to remain hopeful when all others lose hope. Perceived unanswered prayer can drain the hope from our lives. But what, when we have settled the fact that God is in charge, and when we have settled the fact that I'm not God and He is, that gives us the solace and the peace. I Listen to me. I might not like the fact that God answered it in a certain way, but I can rest in the fact that God knows better than what I know. And I can understand that all things work together. Not all things are good, but all things work together. How many of you understand that my life affects another life, affects another life, affects another life, affects another life? You, in, the, in the Christian life, we live within community. And what we do will determine how other people will get what they get and receive what they get. How we love, how we serve, how we give, how we connect. All has to do, and sometimes the reason people don't get answered to their prayers is because of my disobedience. Not because of God's unwillingness. Because God enables me to do something and make a change and be a difference for somebody. But I refuse because I'm going to live my life my way. And nobody better tells me how I'm going to live my life. Bless God, I'm an American and I do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it, however I want to do it. And we take that out. Now, that's great being an American and saying that. That's wonderful. We have our rights. That's beautiful. But can I tell you something? That mentality does not work when you're not in charge. Because you're not in charge. There's no vote in this kingdom. Nobody votes here. There's one vote. It's in the hand of the king. And he decides how things are going to turn out. 
I might not like that, but i got to come to the place in my life where I accept it by faith and release knowing that I might not understand why God has allowed this and why this has taken place, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust. Why? Why, 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 why? That's why, as an atheist, you cannot have the hope that I'm talking about because the hope that I'm talking about is an eternal hope. It's not, it's not a natural hope that hope things will be okay in this life. Here's what I know. Some things will not be okay in this life. Some some things will not turn out the way I want them to turn out. But that does not destroy my hope. Why? Because my hope is not in the natural of this life. My hope is in a supernatural God that has a supernatural future for me. And I know that that's where my hope is in. It is not in the now. It is in the eternal. Let me give you, can you handle one more? Shall, Shall we recap real quick, class? Shall we try this? Okay. What did we say? What caused us to lose hope? What's the first one? Number one. Troubles that seem to have no end. Nobody knows the troubles I'm in. Right? And secondly, what's the second one? Okay, let's try Let's try to read it. Shall we read it? One, two, three. You guys fake them out. You guys just... I mean, you messing around back there, Susie. You did it on purpose, right? <laughs> Trace, next time buy a coffee before service, all right? Okay, that, okay, that's the first one. Let's read the first. Keep it on the first one. <laughs> See, you can have problems everywhere. Yeah. Can you keep it on number one? She's keeping it on number one. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three. When our problems seem to have... No end. We lose hope. We lose hope. Secondly, there you go. Okay, you ready for the fir- uh, third one? Very simply, when our expectations go unmet. When our expectations go unmet. Listen to what Job says in Job 6, verse 11. He says, Where's the strength to keep my hopes up? What future do I have to keep me going? Do you think I have nerves of steel now? Again, Job is getting deeper depressed. The New Living Translation says, do you think I'm a stone? So watch this. He goes from thinking he's an animal, comparing himself to animals. Then he compares himself to a squashed bug. Now he's saying, I'm just an, inan- I'm just an object. I'm just a piece of steel. I'm just, I'm just like a rock. You know, not a good rock. I'm just a rock. All right? Do you think I have nerves of steel? Do you think I'm made of iron? Do you think I can pull myself up by my bootstraps? Why? I don't have any boots. I mean... <laughs> And is that a true statement? Yes. Why is that a true statement? Because he's sitting on the ash heap of his burnt house. When he's making the statement, everything is destroyed around him. And he's literally scraping his wounds with a broken piece of pot shirt. And then his wife comes and she gives him a great word of encouragement. How many of you would love to have Job's wife as a wife? You thought your wife was challenging. You thought your husband was challenging. Check this out. She walks up to him and she says, hey, sucker, why don't you do this? Why don't you just curse God and die? That's what his wife told him. Now, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about him being restored to his wife or even getting rid of her. The Bible doesn't say anything. We just know that he was restored to everything else. I'm just wondering what happened there, but that's just, you know, my thought. But Job is saying that he does not even know. What is he saying? He says, I don't even know where to start. He thought life was going to be a certain way, and it ended up not being what he thought it was going to be. Now, it is great when things turn out. Can we all agree with that? It's great, and it's it's wonderful, but sometimes they don't. And the temptation in those moments would be to give up. And when I say give up, I don't, I'm not meaning in a place of surrender, in a place of trust and submission, but give up on God, give up on faith, give up on hope, give up on our future. Look what he says in verse 14. When desperate people give up on God Almighty, their friends at least should stick with them. But my brothers are fickle as gulch in the desert. One day they're gushing with water from melting ice and snow, cascading out of the mountains. But by midsummer they dry gullies, baked dry in the sun. Job is disappointed in God, and now he's disappointed in his friends. Is that not true? That when we get depressed, when we get disappointed, when we lose our hope, first of all, we blame God, and then we start blaming everybody else. Is it not true? Then we start saying, well, you know, if that pastor would just preach better sermons, you know, if that, if that church would just be more encouraging, well, if that, but you know what, we are the ones that disconnect. We are the ones that start sitting on the front row, then the middle row, then the back row, then in no row. 
And then we go row, row, row the boat ashore. And, and we, we get all out of here. And we wonder why. You take yourself out of community. You take yourself out of faith. You take yourself out of encouragement. You take yourself, and now you're literally striving against all wisdom. And you say, oh, it's going to be okay. You need community. You Listen to me. You need to listen to people even if you don't want to hear what they have to say. Some of you are just not wise. I, I didn't want to use the word stupid, but some of you are just not wise. And Job is now saying, he says, my friends, I mean, they should at least cry with me here. Now, he's got some sense in one way, but no sense in another way. He's disappointed. He's disappointed. Unmet expectation leads us to a place of disappointment. And that causes us, listen to me now, to look for what we need, which is hope in the wrong places. That's when you start looking at everything else. That's when that thing that you got an, oh, with, that you overcame now becomes so attractive again. Some of you come out of lifestyles. God brought you out of things. God delivered you out of things. And now, you, now those things that God delivered you out of, now suddenly they start looking attractive again. Why? Because your eyes are on the problem. Your eyes are on the difficulty. Your eyes are on the unmet expectation. And now suddenly, you know, now suddenly it looks attractive. Now suddenly it looks, oh, you know, that's going to give me, oh, that's going to give me some satisfaction. But how many of you know God delivered you from that stuff? He got you out of that stuff. And it might look good. It might look attractive. But what it's going to produce in your life, it's going to produce death. It's going to produce pain more than you can ever imagine. And you're going to lose the very thing that you're trying to gain. Because you're looking for hope in the wrong place, in the wrong thing. Can I tell you something? Hope is not found in a thing. Hope is not found in an experience. Hope is not found in a moment. Hope is not even found in a movement. Hope is found in a person. And his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And if you look for hope anywhere else, you are not going to find it. Today, if are you watching online, if you're here in this room and you've never embraced Christ, I want you to know the hope that I'm talking about, this confident hope, can only happen when you submit your life and say, God, I want you to be in charge of my life. Watch what, what Luke writes out of the mess in Luke 21. Be on your guard. Don't let the sharp edge of your expectation get dulled by parties and drinking and shopping. I love the message Bible, don't you? Otherwise, that day is going to take you by complete surprise. He says, man, you, you, uh, what expectation? The hope of him coming again. The hope of him returning. So let me, let me close this. And I'm going to only give you one application. And then over the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll talk more in detail about this. But let me give you one application. Are you ready for it? Simply fill this in. Allow hope to be the anchor of your soul. Allow hope to be the anchor of your soul. So, so working through these things, working through the disappointments, working through the unanswered prayer, working through the process, that's what Paul is saying about this endurance. That's what Paul is saying about building character. That's what Paul is saying. That's how we build it. Now watch this. Watch these verses. And these are so powerful. So powerful. Are you ready? Look at them. Hebrews 6 verse 17. God wanted to prove that his promise was true to those who would get what he promised. And he wanted them to understand clearly that his purpose has never changed. So he made an oath. So how many of you, how many of you understand why God is doing this? Because he, he wants you to know that you can rely on him. He wants you to know that he's trustworthy. He wants you to know that what he's promised is going to come to pass. Watch this. These two things cannot change. Somebody say these two things cannot change. Watch this. God cannot lie when he makes a promise. And he cannot lie when he makes an oath. It's impossible for God to lie. Okay, watch. These things encourage us who come to God for what? Safety. They give us strength to hold on to the what? Come on, yell it at me. To hold on to the what? Hope. So, so now watch this. He's showing you what gives you what? Hope. He says what gives me hope is the thing that God makes an oath and God makes a promise. And here's the hope that God's promise and, God, and because of God's promise cannot change. God cannot change. The promise cannot change. The, the oath cannot change. And that's now, that gives me confidence in my hope. How, how, how does this work? This works great. Watch this. These things encourage us. Somebody say encourage. Who come to whom? God for safety. So you're not going to find hope anywhere else. You're going to find him, watch this. They give us strength to hold on to the what? Hope we have been given. Now watch this. We have this what? Hope as a what? Anchor for the what? Soul, sure and? Ooh, there it is again. So hope always deals with the mind. 
It deals with the future in my mind when I'm believing God for, watch this. Now, here's where the power lies. Are you ready? I feel like the, the, the commercial. Wait, there's more. And there is so much more. Watch this. It enters this, this what? This hope. What, where does this hope go? It enters behind the curtain in the most holy place where? Oh, Snoop Dogg. That's good. Snoop Dogg is Hebrew for hallelujah for those of you who don't know. Or maybe I should say Drake. That's good. I, I don't even know who the... No? Don't say that. Okay, who should I say? Katy Perry? No, not that either. Just stick, just, yeah, I'll just stick to Snoop. Uh, yeah, I'll just stick to him. Watch this. It, now, 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 why can I have hope? Because watch where my hope is. Where does my hope go? Where's my hope place? Not, I hope things will turn out. My hope is very much in the very presence of God behind the veil and the holy place. So why can I have hope? Because my hope is anchored in God's presence. Now, let me say this to you. You've got to get this. You've got to understand this. Can I take two more minutes? Can I take two minutes? Let me break this down for you. You and I need the presence of God. Now, every person on this planet is a benefactor from and are drawing their benefit from the presence of God. Because God's presence is everywhere. As a matter of fact, God's presence is in the middle of a bar. God's presence is in the middle of a bar. Now, you, you, there's no way you can go on this planet or off this planet that God's presence is not there. God's presence is everywhere. There's no place that's devoid of God's presence on this planet. You've got to get it. You are on the golf course. God's presence is there. You are at wherever you are, maybe at your in-law's house. Uh, God's presence is there. You are in a fight and an argument. God's presence is there. God's presence is everywhere. But there's a difference between God's omnipresence and God's manifest presence. You see, in what you and I need, we don't, we don't just need to know and recognize that we're in God's presence because that helps us. Why, why is it important to know God's omnipresence? Because it helps me with accountability. It helps me to live my life right. It helps me to know that wherever I go and whatever I do, God sees, God knows. That's God's omnipresence, so it helps me to keep accountable. But what fills my hope is not just the omnipresence of God, but it is the manifest presence of God. And the manifest presence of God is what happens when we come together. We bring all of our stories here on a Sunday morning. Some of you are high, some of you are low, some of you are up, some of you are down. Some of you have gone through difficulty, some of you have gone through pain, some of you had prayers answered, some of you have business just made a great deal. And and you bring all of that together, and together we worship Him, and together we lift up our voices in a crescendo of worship. We say the same thing at the same time in worship, and it brings the manifest. You feel the presence of God, and that fuels your hope. Why? Because it causes you to say, I, I know it's going to be tough on Monday. I know it might be tough on Tuesday, but guess what? My hope is anchored in the manifest presence of God. Why? Because it's placed right there in His presence. The presence problem with some Christians, they are never in His presence. And that's why we lose the hope. Not because God doesn't want to give it, not because it is not there, but because we don't pursue it. That's why you have to allow hope to be the anchor of your soul because when I deal with a problem on Monday morning and I want to drift, the hope catches like an anchor for a boat because it's anchored in the presence of God and it holds me. And here's another wave and it's going to blow me to the other side, but I don't get too far off. How many of you know the problem with most people is that they overcorrect many more times? And what I mean overcorrect, we go from zero to 100 in no time. Instead of just being anchored in the place where God has called us. And even though the, the winds blow, but my hope is anchored in His presence, so it holds me. So the wind blows from the other side. There's problems here. There's problems there. There's problems everywhere. But my hope is anchored in His presence, and I shall not be moved. Because I have an expectation because I've been in His presence, that He has my future in His hands. 
Yes, it's tough. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, this has happened. And I didn't want this to happen. Yes, I acknowledge that. I admit that. And that's why I have to surrender and say, God, I don't understand. But I'm surrendering to you. But in this moment, I'm holding on to my hope. Because I'm allowing your presence to fill me, to touch me, to change me, to heal me, to restore me. So that I can do what needs to be done. Don't take yourself out of community. And don't take yourself out of fellowship. And don't take yourself out of his word. And don't take yourself out of his presence you will not find the answer out there you'll only find it in him through him by him Christ in me the hope of glory let's bow our heads this morning if you're here today and I, I don't know your journey I really don't, and I, I don't make light of it either. I just want you to know that God loves you. But there's a God who cares. If you're watching online, just bear with us just for another moment. God loves you. And I know we hear this, and we hear it so many times that we joke, about, oh, God's got a plan, and God's got a plan, and we just kind of kind of walk away from it. But the reality is he does. And his grace is sufficient for you. This is the beauty of the grace of God that we get what we don't deserve. And that's judgment. Because mercy is available. Maybe today you've kind of walked away and kind of did your thing. But today the Holy Spirit is just tugging on your heart and saying, son, daughter, I love you so much. I died for you. Come home. Come home. Let his grace flood you. Let his grace heal you. Let his grace restore you. Let his grace give you a fresh start. No emotion here, just a decision of the mind that acknowledges that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. A belief in the heart that God raised him from the dead. And then a confession with the mouth that I need that Christ who died for me on the cross, who shed his blood for me. I need Jesus to save me because I cannot save myself. And I need to acknowledge him as the one that's in charge of my life. So therefore I surrender, I submit. Simple as that. And then I follow the process. Which means I embrace him and I grow with him and I allow him to call the shots. So today, if you're in this room and you haven't done that, or maybe you have, but you walked away from God. You're watching online. I'm just going to ask you very simply to do something for me, and that is to raise your hand. Not yet, but that is to raise your hand. and say, Henny, why do I raise my hand? Because Jesus makes this statement. He says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. By raising your hand, it's just a simple acknowledgement is that you need God. I'm a man. I'll see that. And we'll pray together. So if that's you today and you want to pray that prayer with me. And you want to make that commitment or you want to recommit your heart to the Lord. Today can be your day. So if that's you. While every head is bowed, every eye closed. Would you just pop your hand up real quick and let me see it. Thank you. 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 Back there, I see it. Thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you. You can put it down. Thank you. Over there, I see it. God bless you. Thank you. Back there, I see that. Thank you. God bless you. Online, you don't have to raise your hand, but why don't you pray this prayer with me? And I'm going to ask if you a Christ follower today. Would you pray with us? There's no magic in this prayer. It's just a way of committing our lives to him. Let's pray together. Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you. For your grace and your mercy, today I surrender all of my heart, all of my life to you. I ask that you would save me and rescue me from the power of sin. That you'd give me a fresh start from today. I want to follow you and no other. Help me, Jesus, to follow you every day of my life. 
I am yours. You are mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.